Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. And uh, so I'm going to start the show with uh, developing for uh, a platform, uh, developing an application with a multi-component uh, platform while keeping your sanity. Uh, the talk is uh, actually a lot more about continuous delivery and continuous uh, deployment than about continuous integration. Um, I mean, how many of you here are using Jenkins for continuous integration for building and so? Okay, and how many for continuous delivery, continuous deployment? Okay, so that's the new things. Uh, there is a lot less. Uh, and so we started at JFrog, and we eat our own dog food, and. Uh, well, we had fun doing it. So this is a talk about how basically we are continuously deploying bin to the cloud. So this is me. I'm Fred Simon, the chief architect of uh, JFrog uh, since 2008, since the foundation. Uh, and uh, most of the slides here are done by uh, Barrow Sadogorski, our developer advocate. And as you can see, he has a lot of respect for his manager. Uh, so who is JFrog? Uh, so JFrog is uh, basically uh, the company that are managing uh, binaries. We have a lot of frogs. Uh, we are in Santa Clara and in Israel. And we have two products, Artifactory and Bintray. Uh, both of them works together to manage binaries. This is what we are going to talk about, is how to uh, aggregate, distribute, and make uh, an application that manage a lot, a lot of uh, binary files, a lot of data, and a lot of metadata around binary files. So the talk is about Bintray, uh, our second product. Um, and um, if you want to hear more about Artifactory, you can go to our booth. So uh, basically, the agenda is uh, a lot of borrowing me. <laughs> uh, the, the purpose of the talk is basically to uh, give you some uh, uh, feedback and some tips and tricks on all the things that we suffer when we try to set in place uh, a multi-component development environment, uh, so from uh, development to production. Uh, one thing that I really like as a kind of a sentence when I think about this uh, process and what we went through, it's uh, uh, Stash, I always forget his name, from Yahoo, uh, one of the uh, main guy at Yahoo that wants to do continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So he said, from commit to production without uh, human intervention. Okay. And when you think about it, you need a human being to think about the code and think about writing the code. But whatever is going on between this piece of code going to production is just pushing buttons and doing things that can be completely automated. Okay? And so the goal of everything that we are doing here is basically how to make the full process of a commit going into Git going to production without any human intervention. It can sound scary, but it's quite kind of fun. OK, so uh, this is Bintray, like I said, uh, a big uh, SaaS application. It's a central web uh, uh, server, so there is no, um, we are in control of everything. We are in control of the deployment. We are in control of uh, the DNS. We are in control of the full infrastructure. OK, it's not uh, like Artifactory, which is more uh, uh, software that we distribute to our customer and our customer base here. It's a software that we are uh, fully in control of in terms of infrastructure, deployment, and execution. Um, and uh, lots and lots of um, things that are going on uh, into it. A uh, lot of uh, files and um, so a lot of metadata. Okay. So basically, uh, a lot of information associated with the file, a lot of file to distribute, and a lot of metadata users and, uh, and environment. Okay. So we designed this application in, uh, we, we started really, really coding in uh, uh, 2011. Uh, so the, the main thing. So most of uh, all the tools we choose were, were cho chosen in uh, 2011. So quite a green field, uh, recent product. Okay, and we really, really love all the tool and framework that we chose, and uh, we had uh, some uh, uh, good luck and some bad luck. <laughs> okay, the first thing we chose, we needed uh, to have some metadata about the file and folder all over the planet, so it's a CDN-based uh, environment, uh, Bintray, so it's distributing the binaries uh, using a CDN platform, and so we needed 
all over the planet to have rapid, rapid query and rapid feedback about the state of the files, which files are available, what are the latest version of whatever package and modules, and things like that. So we decided about Couch and uh, CouchDB uh, to serve these needs and to provide basically the metadata of the files and folders uh, all over the planet. For the web UI, uh, we are groovy guys. I mean, there is a lot, a lot of uh, web framework that you can choose out there, but we choose Grails. Uh, and uh, so we went with the full uh, Groovy Grails uh, platform for all the web UI. Uh, on top of the Groovy Grails, for mainly the user management and the, the web UI and all the query on the web UI itself, we chose MongoDB. So MongoDB uh, for uh, providing all the, the data and, and the metadata. That's already two NoSQL database. Wait, there is more. Uh, we needed a lot of cache and a lot of caching of all this data on all this information. So we chose Memcache at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, well, basically, we switched it to EHCache. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the main reason here is uh, basically Java. Uh, the fact that uh, EHCache, I don't know, how many of you are using EHCache? To see the, nobody? Nobody use EHCache? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Three. <laughs> okay. And memcache? Memcache? Wow. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, one of the main reasons is we are a Java shop, a groovy shop, and uh, we had some issue with, uh, with all the infrastructure and, and, and memcache, and the EH cache was a lot easier for us uh, to manipulate and manage. And, uh, and we really, really liked it, and it, it works really good. Uh, the other story is after we needed a really good index for uh, doing search queries and search indexing and all this uh, on all the data. So we started with Sphinx, which is extremely fast at providing answer uh, about all the data that he indexed. Uh, and uh, we switched to Elasticsearch. Um, so the main reason here is basically, uh, I don't know if it's the success of the platform or whatever, but the amount of new data and the amount of new information that were coming inside Bintray uh, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis was way, way too much for Sphinx. Okay, so Sphinx is not really good at uh, dynamically and real-time indexing. And so whenever we needed to do a re-index, we needed to do the, the full re-indexing, is recreating this table and, and everything. So we switched to Elasticsearch, which is a lot, lot more performant, are doing this uh, continuous re-indexing and, uh, and uh, continuous um, index building, okay? Uh, the other thing, by the way, we participated a lot into the Grails Elasticsearch uh, uh, integration, and we have today a, a really, really good uh, Grails Elasticsearch integration. I'm really happy about it. And of course, to NoSQL database was not at all. We used also Redis. <laughs> so, uh, and this one is mainly for statistics. So in Bintray, you can get real-time statistics about the download of your files and uh, all the, what's going on in, inside the system. We use it also for task management and, uh, and uh, task communication between all the parts of the system. So we're really, really happy about Redis. And finally, one last piece of the multi-component, we have also a web server a front-end web server to uh, communicate with all the back-end REST API and all the web UI, okay? So we chose uh, Apache web, uh, HTTP server that we switched to NGINX. That's it, that's finished. <laughs> so NGINX, CouchDB, Grails, MongoDB, EHCache, ElasticDB, and Redis. This is what we called a multi-component environment, okay? How do you provide this to a development environment? How do you develop and uh, do continuous delivery and continuous deployment in a secure way, all the way from a commit of a developer to production when you have so many pieces and so many configuration pieces in the middle. Okay, that was basically the challenge, and this is what we had to face. Uh, yeah, when you, uh, I mean, uh, there, there was, of, of course, some uh, hiccup along the way, but uh, just for the story, today in Bintray, you have a feedback button, a small blue feedback button on the right side. You click on it, you said something is wrong with the website, or I need a new feature, or whatever. It goes directly into the, the hip chat of uh, uh, all the developers and the Bintray de developers. They are managing the, the support in some way, and if they find that it's actually a bug or a small feature that can be added, they start to work on it, 
and uh, sometimes two hours, four hours after, we send back an answer to the uh, guy that put the feedback. It's on, on the website, you can now use it. So this kind of rapid, rapid feedback between a user request and a deployment and, and, a, and an actual deployment and production and someone that can uh, get the feedback is, um, I mean, it's really, really another way of making software. It's really another way of communicating. And you make basically features that are useful immediately. You don't try to imagine what the user wants. You have this communication and rapid feedback with the, with the uh, consumer, and it's really, really nice. But of course, you have to solve the issue of deploying this whole stack and providing this whole stack uh, to the developer and to the production system. OK, so the other thing is that we are very liberal with our developer. Whatever they like, whatever they want, they can choose Linux. They can choose Windows if they really want to. And they can choose Mac, OK? So all our developers, we have uh, all the different uh, uh, liberal state. And they can do uh, everything they want, like they want it, and, uh, and develop uh, all the stack. So again, all this big, big stack of, uh, of tools and environment for each developer and each developer on the different operating system. OK. so. The main issue, one does not simply set up all this for the developer and for the production. OK. What is the solution? OK. Make it. <laughs> OK. So I think that's what most of us uh, used to do and what most of us, a lot, a lot of script all over the place, a lot of black box that's not supposed to be black box, things that works that nobody wants to touch. Uh, and, uh, and basically all the pieces that uh, kind of work. And uh, yeah, this is what we called uh, making software out of uh, carton and sellotape. Um, so this is not what we went for. <laughs> we choose uh, three, there is three big pieces. Uh, first of all, there is one that can provide uh, a container that can provide, I, I mean, container, I'm already going to the end, but uh, that can provide uh, an environment, a, a virtualized environment of some kind, OK, where all the developer and the production environment are kind of look alike. Uh, we need someone to cook uh, all the different components and the different uh, recipe uh, into those uh, uh, environment and, and cookbooks. And we need someone to orchestrate it all, OK? So I don't think it's uh, too much of a stretch. First of all, this one. We choose Chef. Uh, so Chef is basically uh, the, the platform. How many? Uh, okay, uh, but there is okay. There is no camera on you, so it's okay. You can raise your hand. How many are using Chef? <laughs> How many are using Puppet? Okay. Yeah. So okay. that's. Uh, and how many are using some kind of uh, chef or puppet like, which is not chef and puppet? Okay. Ansible. Ah, oh, yeah, Ansible. Ah, oh, good. Okay, great, yeah. Uh, so, uh, chef what? Um, yeah, I'm French. <laughs> so, uh, so, since I'm in a, in a knowing crowd, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass by here uh, uh, quite fast. But basically, we uh, use Chef to manage all our infrastructure, OK? Today, between Artifactory Online, which use Chef also, and uh, Bintray, uh, we have more than 300 uh, uh, Chef nodes that are managed uh, with, uh, with the Chef server. Uh, and basically, we can write code to define our infrastructure, OK? That's the goal of Chef, OK? You work with cookbooks which uh, define basically how you can deploy uh, each and one component. You have really, really small cookbooks. Um, just uh, uh, change the, the uh, network configuration, uh, things like that, to have enough port open on your Linux platform uh, to uh, very complicated cookbooks of uh, deploying uh, uh, Elasticsearch or, uh, or Tomcat or, or things like that. OK. So uh, the basic cookbook, uh, deploy MySQL. And, and, uh, and do uh, all the work. So what was funny, by the way, uh, I don't know if you had this experience working with Chef and Puppet, it's the same. So for example, this is a piece of code to install MySQL in Ruby on Windows. OK, so you write Ruby code to install MySQL, OK, 
and uh, do, you do that to install MySQL on a, a Windows platform. You, usually, when you start to call to X sysadmin that changed their name and they are called now DevOps. Um, so usually, this is the kind of sentence he said, in which world did I fail in? Now, once you do this move and you start to actually write code to write your infrastructure, everybody wins and, and everybody uh, really, really loves it. But you, you have some kind of hurdle like that to pass. Uh, once you pass it, uh, you have the, the issue of, uh, I don't know if you have some of your uh, people that you interact with or, or the DevOps of the, when you know a hammer, everything looks like an L. So every time they have a problem, they want to write Ruby code. So that goes to the opposite. So <laughs> they want to change a parameter in the, in the load balancer, they have to write Ruby code. So that's just, that's just the way it goes. So like I said, I asked the question, why not Puppet? Well, uh, yeah. That's basically how it went. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you choose between the two. <laughs> OK. So we choose Chef for automating the deployment of all the components. And uh, so it was 2011 um, at the time. And so uh, we choose Vagrant and Vagrant for the uh, uh, management and deployment and the virtualization. So we, uh, how many of you are using Vagrant? Wow, it's big. OK, we, uh, I, I did this talk a, a year ago. And uh, so every time I talk about Vagrant, there's more what's going on in the mind of people. Uh, so yeah, Vagrant is really, really helping uh, creating a normalized, uh, virtualized uh, environment to everyone everywhere, OK? Uh, this is basically the, the benefit of Vagrant. You create a file. OK, and uh, from this file, you can really uh, unify a deployment of the same virtual machine uh, across a different environment, across Mac OS, uh, Windows, or uh, Linux environment, so all our developer and all our environment. The main issue that personally I have with Vagrant is that Vagrant and Chef together, you can use only Chef Solo, OK? So Chef Solo is basically a, a small Chef server that can uh, distribute the recipe and, and, and the data bag uh, uh, to your uh, Vagrant uh, container. But all kind of queries, for example, and the query environment about the list of uh, components and where they are located on a complicated infrastructure network, you cannot do this kind of query on the Chef Solo. So we ended up having a, a little bit of different Chef, uh, which I, do, I don't like uh, too much, between when you are in Chef Solo inside Vagrant or when you are not. So how to set up Vagrant with Chef? Uh, basically, uh, this is uh, the, the bin tray code. Usually, I'm, I'm in the front, but anyway. Uh, so you provision the, the Chef solo, and you give uh, all the roles and uh, uh, all the roles and the cookbooks and everything on the local file system uh, of your uh, repository. So you define the, uh, the main uh, central box. So even if all the developers can choose whatever operating system they want, OK, at the end of the day, our platform, our infrastructure, and our deployment, so we use a soft layer for the cloud for, for Bintray. We have a little bit of Amazon also and, and things like that. We start standardize everything on CentOS 6, OK? So we, we don't want to say, OK, we're going to manage 20 different operating systems for our final infrastructure, but this is CentOS 6. So with this line, basically, the Vagrant file, all the developers, they get the same CentOS 6 that will run in actual production on the same, uh, on the same operating system. We activate the Chef Solo, and we provide uh, so the, um, the path where all the Chef cookbooks and all the Chef data bags and everything uh, are located. This is actually a Git repo, so it's, it's uh, synchronized. And all the different roles uh, that are executed. So in development environment, we use VirtualBox. Uh, so the, uh, actually, today we use uh, VMware, because um, I don't know if some of you had this experience of uh, Vagrant on VirtualBox. It works really, really good, but uh, it's actually way, way slower than uh, VMware. So if you have the opportunity to use uh, VMware and, uh, and the VMware stack, even on the local machine of your developer, the VMware, uh, Vagrant and VMware works 
a lot faster. So the vagrant is uh, starting a CentOS uh, and uh, connect it to Chef and start to deploy all the components on the vagrant CentOS box. All the things that are inside the Chef, all the configuration, all the data bag, all the recipes, all, the, all this stuff is inside Git and it's coming from GitHub. Okay, this is how it looks. So it's all the cookbooks and all the things. What's really, really amazing when you start to do this kind of stuff, when you start to have a Git repository that define all your recipe, all your infrastructure, infrastructure are code, okay, is that the one that are actually writing this code are the sysadmin that become DevOps, okay? And they love it. <laughs> they start to mess up with the developer environment. Okay, so this is what I call close the loop. You used to have a development environment. Here is my web app or here is my, and they give it to the operation guy and the operation guy said, what do I do with that? And, and they were, they, I mean, I went to company where they had actual fight between the operation and the developers because everybody was putting the blame of whatever production issue was going on between one and another. Here you have a closed loop. Okay, you have the DevOps guys, the guys that are defining the infrastructure, the, the guys that are configuring the system. They are committing into a Git repository, the infrastructure, and the developer every morning, they run their Vagrant box and they run the stuff that the uh, infrastructure DevOps guys are doing. Okay, so they, you have a natural full cooperation between the ops and the dev, between the dev, everybody becomes DevOps. Okay, and then you get immediate feedback, of course, from the developer that says, wait, if you're gonna put that in production, what I'm doing right now in the application is not gonna work, and you get this really, really good uh, communication between the, the environment, okay? This is the, for me, this is the single most big benefit of infrastructure as code, okay? Is that the people that are responsible for the infrastructure are actually providing uh, back code to the developer, and the developer are interacting with it all the time. So, uh, just conclusion. Vagrants boot the CentOS on the virtual box, Chef install all the database and the services, so all these NoSQL database and all the connection, the ports that are configured correctly. Uh, we use uh, Artifactory, of course, for a private YUM repository where we put the RPM that are validated. So yeah, that's also one, one issue. When you do this kind of uh, container, uh, uh, virtualized uh, CentOS environment and, uh, and infrastructure uh, distribution, you start to uh, send a lot, a lot of binaries all across the developers and all across the test platform, all across the Jenkins and things like that, okay? So having a local binary repository manager for us, I mean, we use Artifactory, of course, but uh, that was really, really uh, a big, big plus. I mean, without it, the, you spend 80 to 90% of your time just looking at your vagrant downloading stuff and, uh, and trying to update uh, the CentOS, when you do YUM, YUM update on CentOS, it goes to the CentOS uh, remote repo, try to update its cache and uh, all this stuff. When you have a local binary repo, uh, everything is local and uh, you do that in, uh, in minutes instead of, uh, I mean, in, in less than a minute instead of multiple ones. Profit, of course. <laughs> okay, so we have a great developer infrastructure as code and everything. And now uh, someone has to do that, okay? Uh, it's still the scary part. Uh, I mean, it's going to production. You know that once it's out there, uh, every mess and uh, every stupid uh, code that you wrote and every infrastructure as code that you wrote is gonna be exposed to the world. So it's still a scary step. And uh, uh, yeah, it's still something that uh, people have a problem doing automatically. So. Uh, there is one piece here that is missing, which is Jenkins. And so here we use Jenkins. It's Jenkins putting our code to production, okay? I don't know how many of you are doing that, but you need some kind of certain trust on your continuous delivery integration. And that's the point where you said, okay, I did it, okay? How many of you are using Jenkins to go to prod? Good. Wow, that's amazing. The, the, the progress in the, I mean, doing that for too long and the, the progress. Uh, and so I, I don't know how, how, how to, to emphasize that, but once it's uh, Jenkins actually doing, <laughs> there is this kind of, uh, uh, it's not me, it's Jenkins. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but 
so the, the main thing here that, that is really, really important is traceability, okay? When Jenkins is doing it, Jenkins needs to know what he's doing, okay? You need to be able to trace back. There was this uh, going to production that was done on this specific build, and you need to trace it back all the way to the uh, actual uh, code that was changed, the list of git commit that was uh, integrated into the specific push, and, uh, and, and what's going on. So full traceability and uh, actual real visibility of, uh, of this process is critical. So, uh, of course, it's uh, quite simple to make Jenkins go to production. You just ask Jenkins to do it, and he will do it. Uh, the problem is uh, who's going to push the button. So, the other thing that I'm going to start to do, talk about is now is everything was running in a vagrant box. You had all this CouchDB, Red, uh, Grails, application, Tomcat, uh, all, all this stuff was running in my vagrant box. Now I need to run on my big cloud infrastructure. There was cloud, cloud, cloud everywhere. And uh, we, we had some, some talk about how much do we manage and how much do, do we do. Everything that we found that can be SaaS, that can be software as a service, we got, okay? We said, okay, we don't want to deal with it, and we let the company that actually wrote the code of uh, the code go to SaaS. So you don't simply take the Vagrant code and put it in production. You don't put the Vagrant. You, we started with Vagrant, CentOS, uh, uh, and the Chef environment. The first thing we did to replace Vagrant is to use soft layer with CentOS machine and jCloud. And so we move a lot more on, on the OpenStack environment and all this kind of, of setup. Here, now, all the machine and all the CentOS are provided by the cloud soft layer environment. We do the same with the Amazon and Amazon environment. Chef, we offload to Chef. So there is a getchef.com. They provide Chef server as a service. You can go and ask them uh, to set it up. Mongo, we use Mongo HQ. We ask them, take care of, uh, of my MongoDB. Uh, I'm going to connect to them, and, uh, and they provide uh, scalability and, and, and all this stuff. Uh, and uh, CouchDB, we use CloudDant, and again, uh, distributed uh, between uh, Amsterdam and, uh, and Dallas, and it's uh, fully replicated and uh, accessible from uh, all over the planet, and we don't have to care, to care of our CouchDB, and a CouchDB synchronization and replica and all this kind of stuff. I mean, if you want to have fun, uh, you can, but they know what they are doing. They have the better monitoring tool. I was talking this morning yeah, about, about it, is monitoring a system when you actually wrote the code and you know exactly what is going on, you know exactly what kind of monitoring element you need to get. They're going to get the information about something is wrong in the, in the CouchDB or in the MongoDB way, way before anything that we can do by ourselves. Okay? So this is also uh, the, the plus of uh, having a SaaS model. So the good, uh, easy setup, uh, it's basically the same. And uh, basically, the only thing that we do is that we change uh, who is uh, uh, provisioning uh, the, the services. Instead of doing it ourselves, we just connect uh, to whatever uh, uh, system. The other thing about cloud, cloud, cloud everywhere, it's kill instead of fix. Okay, so that's kind of hard for a lot, a lot of software and a lot of environment. Okay, but whenever something doesn't go, you just kill the VM and recreate and restart it. Okay, uh, it's kind of a, you, you restart from scratch. You restart really from a pure base CentOS and you reset everything on it, and and you try to do it. Uh, on Amazon, actually, it's uh, it's quite funny, but from time to time you end up on on a bad machine. Your VM is. Uh, and so you just kill the VM, try to put it on another zone or whatever, and everything works. So that's the kind of thing that happens. In Netflix, by the way, I don't know if you know, but Netflix, before they actually use any instance, they pop up the instance and they have a bunch of tests to make sure that it's a good one, that, it, <laughs> that the access to the disk, that the network, that everything is okay. And they say, okay, uh, they didn't give me crap, I can use it. Uh, for most of us, which don't have the same than Netflix and Amazon contract, uh, we have to make sure that we can restart. <laughs> so, uh, so the main issue, like I said, Chef Solo is not exactly the same than Chef Server. Uh, it's a little bit annoying because Chef Server is really, really powerful. You can really do some uh, complicated query about where are all your infrastructure tools, 
and uh, do some really good load balancing and, and things like that by doing nice chef queries uh, on the chef server. And you don't have that when you have inside the vagrant environment, which is a, a little bit annoying. Uh, and yeah, so some black box magic, uh, less and less. I mean, the goal is really for the developer to do an SSH inside their vagrant and see the, the system to be connected to the infrastructure and how the, the code, because most of what the, our developers are doing is Grails. Okay, they are writing Grails code and they are con communicating. Okay, they are not writing Mongo or extending Mongo or, or whatever. They are interacting with it. Okay, so, but they need to get inside it and look at the log when something goes wrong and things. And so to make all your developers be capable of doing the monitoring and the, and the work of the DevOps is always a good thing. And so we try to avoid uh, the fact that I started my Vagrant, it doesn't work. Uh, I call the DevOps guys and I don't try to, to see what's going on. And uh, of course, there is need to be for uh, ugly, but I don't have any ugly. Uh, <laughs> OK, what's next? Everybody guess? OK, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we already started uh, a lot. We migrated a lot of our test infrastructure and, and environment to, to Docker. Uh, it's a lot faster. The management of the container is better. And Artifactory today support uh, uh, Docker images. So we can put all our images back and forth into Artifactory. And we have really, really rapid uh, development flow and, and, and feedback on the Docker environment. Yeah, the main advantage of Docker is speed for me, but uh, all the containers are really with the diff, so you, you really pile the container, it's really, really nice. Um, you can uh, really decide which uh, uh, software goes into which container. You create, in Vagrant, we created one big Vagrant CentOS and all the systems, so you need a lot of memory. Okay, with, uh, with Docker, you actually use a lot less and you create a lot more small Dockers for each one of those guys, and they communicate uh, between them. Um, yeah, so it, it works really, really good. And uh, today we have a Gradle uh, scripts and Jenkins scripts that manage all this deployment of this uh, uh, Docker and uh, uh, Docker integration. Okay, so it allows us basically from Jenkins uh, to spawn up uh, all those environments. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>